Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, how can there be a poetry course without Dunn and his compass? We have the compass here moving around. In this lecture, we will look at two poems. One, a valediction forbidding morning, but we will see only the last two four stanzas where we have this compass. The next poem is the canonization. As we did earlier, we will spend some time for the historical and literary context and also learn a little more about John Dunn and further go ahead with the analysis of the canonization in depth. We will have two critical readings, one is a new critical reading and another a deconstructive reading and then conclude our presentation. Let us pay attention to the historical and literary context of John Dunn from Elizabethan period to Jacobean period and Caroline period. We have the life of John Dunn spreading over. This period was characterized by religious intolerance between various groups particularly Protestants and Catholics. At this time, we also find the world expanding geographically in science, in trade and also in lifestyle of people. Educated young people had the aspiration to get into courtly service. They wanted to become courtiers or government servants get some patronage for making their livelihood. When it comes to the literary context, we notice that the sonnet sequence was slowly disappearing and a number of poetic forms were coming up and the most important art form that we have to notice is musk, a fusion of several art forms dance, drama, song and spectacle. King James I encouraged it and many poets, dramatists came out with their best mass to entertain the king, the court and the public. Dan for his own part was writing songs, sonnets, sermons and pamphleteering and many other things. As we saw earlier, John Dan was a scholar, a priest and a poet and a great lover. He loved and more and married her in secret that led to his suffering for nearly 15 years. He renounced the world for the sake of his own love for his sweetheart and more. He also changed his religion for the sake of his job. At that time, Catholics were not entitled for government positions or important positions in Elizabethan society or 17th century, early 17th century society. When he got the job of preaching, he preached the word of God, the gospel of God. At the same time, he was also aware of the gospel of mammon the god of wealth because most of the Protestants and other religious groups, people from England and other European countries, they were after wealth, they were after money, they were after several conquests, they were after imperial power, colonizing power. They wanted to enrich themselves with the resources from the rest of the world. Now let us see the last four stanzas of a valediction for bedding morning. We have the context of a lover 
separating from his beloved, a man had to go out from his hometown to other places to earn money, to earn wealth, to see the world for various reasons. So, here is a valediction from the man to his beloved that is a farewell, but he says do not cry, do not feel bad about it to describe how he is always together with his beloved. He uses this image of a compass with two legs, they are moving both of them are moving, but they are united, they are together always. So, this is one of the most famous conceits, metaphysical conceits from John Den and we have a moving picture here to reveal to us how the central leg is fixed in one place, but then it is also moving along with the peripheral leg that is the man. Let us see the last four stanzas now. Our two souls therefore, which are one, though I must go endure not yet a breach, but an expansion like gold to yarry thinness beat. Here we have a simile, we can call it gold simile or golden simile. He says, he may go out, but he will stretch himself in such a way like the gold. He has the malleability to extend himself from his beloved, he will never be separated from her. Then he comes out with this compass conceit. If they be two, they are two so as stiff with compasses are two, thy soul, thy fixed foot makes no show to move, but that if the other do, both of them are moving together. And though it in the center set, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it and grows erect as that comes home. Such will thou be, be to me, who must like the other foot obliquely run, thy firmness makes my circle just and makes me end where I began. So, the beginning and end is the same for the poet, he is not separated from his beloved. Now, let us discuss the canonization in detail. We have five stanzas, we will see them one after another, but discussion we will have at the end. For every stanza, we have the rhyme scheme here, the same rhyme scheme will be found in all the stanzas. All the stanzas have love in the first line and also in the last line. This is highlighted. We will, we will also notice the triplets we have in place, grace and face and in all stanzas we have the same similar structure. In this particular stanza, we have a chiasmic structure in the fourth line that is where we have underlined it. Let us move forward now. <clears throat> For God's sake hold your tongue and let me love, or chide my palsy or my gout, my five grey hairs or ruin the fortune flout. With wealth your state, your mind with arts improve, take you a course, get you a place, observe his honour or his grace or the king's real or his stamped face, contemplate what you will approve, so you will let me love. Stanza 2, alas, alas, who is injured by my love? What merchant ships have my sighs drowned? Who says my tears have overflowed his ground? When did my coals a forward spring remove? When did the heats which my veins fill add one more to the plaguey bill? Soldiers find wars and liars find out still, litigious men which quarrels move though she and I do love. Stanza 3, call us what you will, we are made such by love, call her one, me another fly, we are tapers too and at our own cost die, and we in us find the eagle and the dove, the phoenix
bridle hath more weight by s v2 being 1 or it. So, to one neutral thing both sexes fade, we die and rise the same and prove mysterious by this love. Stanza 4. We can die by it if not live by love and if unfit for tombs and hearts, our legend be it will be fit for worse and if no piece of chronicle we prove, we will build in sonnets a pretty rooms as well a well wrought urn becomes the greatest ashes as how we acre tombs and by these hymns all shall approve as canonized for love. Here is the last stanza and thus invokes you whom reverend love made one another's hermitage, you to whom love was peace that now is rage, who did the whole world's soul contract and drove into the glasses of your eyes, so made such mirrors and such pies that they did all to you epitomize countries, towns, courts, back from above a pattern of your love. We have a number of questions to think about the poem. These questions will guide us to understand the canonization much better. What does the title indicate? How does the poem begin, progress and end? Who is the speaker? The poet, yes. There is a persona, yes but this is a persona of the lover. Who is the listener? The lady love, the world, who is spoken about or what is spoken about? What are the key words and images we have in this poem? What are the structural, linguistic, poetic and technical devices which have contributed to making this poem? Which words, structures, images are repeated in this poem? What contrasting ideas images are juxtaposed, what does the poem achieve or convey to the reader? What is the love the poem compared with? How does the poet communicate the securing of his own love in this particular poem? These are the questions we will discuss them in the next few minutes. Let us begin with the title. Canonization means the process of making somebody a saint. This is a practice in Christianity. If somebody is found to have some extraordinary powers, divine powers, that person is made a saint like Mother Teresa. Initially, she was not a saint, but later on her contribution to the world was recognized the contribution that she made with the divine grace was accepted and then she was canonized. The canonization is in this poem the beatification of lovers that is canonizing making them saints. We have a spiritual miracle in the case of a saint and we have a sexual spectacle in the case of the poet the speaker and his lady love. We have a pun with this word canon, C A N O N can also mean a priest and this canonization can refer to becoming or making a priest of both spiritual and sexual love. When we look at the pun a little more carefully, we can see that this canon can also refer to a gun. What does the poet Dunn do with his gun? He fires off his love. He fires off his opponents of love. Let us see the beginning, end and middle of this poem. At the beginning, we have a command to the world to shut up their mouth. The listener can refer to a large number of people representing the whole society. At the end, we have an invocation to make a pattern of love out of the lovers. In the middle, we have a number of rhetorical questions and the answers and the alternatives in three stanzas, stanza 2, 3 and 4. The question who is affected by my love has that implicit answer none none is affected by our love, then why do they bother about us? That is a question that done asks. 
he describes himself in several images. We die as two birds and rise as one phoenix. There is a mythical bird called phoenix which dies and then rises in flame as a new bird. At this juncture, he tells us, if his love is unfit for tombs and hers, at least it is fit for verse, that is poetry. If it is unfit for chronicles, histories, it may be fit for sonnets, that is his poems. Probably he refers to the sonnets in which many poets write about their love for their lady love. At the end, we notice that this poem is a well wrought on. This is a song of praise for love. Through this song, Dan is able to canonize the speaker and the beloved. And probably he is making this idea of love a holy, a spiritual experience for all people. There is obviously a message in this poem and this message is conveyed in interaction with several interlocutors. The interlocutors may not be speaking in turn, but then he responds, the poet responds to different ideas from various sections of the people. There is a persona that is a speaker who argues that love is a personal affair. Nobody should interfere with that. And there are many opponents of love. They cannot keep quiet. They will say or quote many authorities and say love is love, but it should be done in a prescribed way. But these two people in our poem the speaker and the lady love, they are unique and they are unique in such a way that they can become saints of love and they have a pattern of love in this poem as the mythical bird phoenix and also referring to the Grecian urn or some, some artistic urn which can represent love forever. There are a number of key words and images in this poem love, approve, tapers, fly, eagle, dove, phoenix. Then we have prove, after that we have verse, sonnets, well wrought urn, hymns and hermitage. Finally, all these images together, words together epitomize the love of the speaker and the lady love in a pattern of love, in a spiritual pattern of love in a pattern of love which is admirable for people. We have tapers in this presentation and we have a picture. It refers to the self-sacrifice. They grow and die within themselves. That is a whole idea that is connected with phoenix which rises from its own flame. This is such a great poem where we have a large number of poetic devices starts from apostrophe, the whole poem is something like an address. For God's sake, hold your tongue, do not talk about our love or me or my lady love and it has this alliteration, let me love fortune flout. This chiasmic structure we have in with wealth your state, your mind with the arts. Words are somewhat different, but structurally there is a chiasmus. We have a number of questions in stanza 2, most of them are rhetorical questions. We have just two lines here. Alas, alas, who is injured by my love? What merchant ships have my sighs drowned? Then we have hyperbole, which we can find in the previous line. Can we imagine? tears of the lover drowning the merchant ships in the sea. So, hyperbolically he is connecting the tears with the ship and he says none is affected. We have a number of images in stanza 3, we use the word whirling of images, a number of images circle around to focus on the love the self-sacrificing love 
which is immortal in the case of John Donne. We mentioned this concept dramatic monologue because there is a kind of implied listener, there is a, an implied speaker, people are that is why we use that expression interlocutors. This poem is an address or a reply to many of those people who are asking questions. Then we have epistrophe, we know strophe, antistrophe, epistrophe in the context of the poetic form called ode. This particular word epistrophe is also a figure of speech in which we have repetition of the same word at the end of many lines. In this poem, we have the repetition of the word love at the end of the first line and the last line in every stanza in all five stanzas. We pay attention to the diction, syntax and tone, we notice that Dan is able to use both Latinate words and common words. Some Latinate words are here, contemplate, litigious, mysterious, canonized, even the word pattern is derived from Latin patronus. As we noticed earlier, we have many repetitions, the word love is repeated 10 times and we have many structures which are repeated, particularly rhetorical questions. We also have a conditional clause in stanza 4, if and then we have this telescoping of images in the form of juxtaposition of dissimilar images. We have old and young people, we have complaining and commending, we have secular and spiritual love and in this poem we have this letter love. The letter L is capitalized for the word love in stanza 4 in line 36. The tone of this poem is conversational, informal. We also have some angry feeling and irritated feeling of this poet, but at the end we find the tone is very serious, it is solemn, he is making his love a great holy experience. The rhythm of this poem is also very interesting. We have the first stanza here, we have color coding for different kinds of metrical patterns that Dunn has used. We have iambic throughout the poem, but then we have different line lengths, penta with 5 feet, tetra with 4 feet and tri with 3 feet. So, for God's sake that is all red colored lines have three lines have 10 syllables and 5 feet. The green colored lines have 8 syllables and 4 feet and this blue colored line last line has 6 syllables and 3 feet. For God's sake hold your tongue and let me love or chide my palsy or my gout, my five grey hairs or ruined fortune flout with wealth your state, your mind with arts improve, take you a course, get you a place, observe his honour or his grace or the king's real or his stamped face, contemplate what you will approve, so you will let me love. And we have indicated the structure, some kind of structure pattern that the poet is creating within the first stanza itself, T I T I means Trocky, I am. That same pattern is uh, maintained in that line, take you a course and get you a place. In the next line, we have a variation, I am, I am, Peric and I am. And in the next line, we have Peric, Spondy, Peric, Spondy. Like this previous one, T I T I P S P S, the poet is making a pattern of love in rhythm as well though the rhythm is varied, not just monotonous, it is divergent, dynamic. Let us pay attention to the rhyme and meter as well. The rhyme scheme as we indicated is ABBA, CCC and AAA. This pattern of reduction from progressively reducing that is from A B B A 4 to 3 C C C and then 2 A A 
and then finally, 1. This first 4 lines are in the form of a quatrain and the second 3 lines are in the form of a triplet and the last 2 lines are in the form of a couplet. And this structure is maintained, rhyme structure is maintained throughout the poem and probably what Dunn tries to indicate is after these two that is to the lady and the lo lover they will become one. Then the words we have in stanza 1 are these love, gout, flout and within this A B B A you can see B B making a couplet, improve, place, grace, face here we have place, grace, face, triplet and lastly approve, love, couplet. But the last two approve and love may not have exact rhyme that is why we call it I rhyme. The meter as we noticed earlier is iambic and we also have some variation of peric and spondy, but then the major rhythm is iambic. We have three variations pentameter, tetrameter and trimeter. We have variation in sesura the way in which Dan is able to give pauses in his lines across the poem. In some places he uses comma, in some other places he uses colon and in some other places he uses semicolon as well. Probably the editors also could have contributed to this kind of punctuation marks, but then they also contribute to making variety in rhythm in this poem. We have enjambment as well that is lines move from one line to the next line. One example in stanza 3 is one line ends with and then it continues to the next line by love. We have rhythm which is dynamic, lovely and to put it short celestial heavenly rhythm. We have a comparison of love with tomb and verse, chronicle and sonnet. Tombs, hers are opposed with verse. This verse is a vehicle or conduit of love, and similarly, chronicles and sonnets are considered to be vehicles of love. In Dunn's case, he finds ashes in an urn to essentialize his love, to condense his love, so that this condensed love can be expanded or it can rise in the form of a phoenix. So, this poem is essentially a hymn of love. We say hymns because it is a song in praise of love for God, love for human beings, love for life. Dan is also a writer of hymns for the Holy Father and Holy Love also. We have two readings, critical readings. One is a new critical reading. We have a new critic called Clayant Brooks. He has an essay, The Language of Paradox in his book, The well Wrought Urn. There he says, the language of poetry is the language of paradox. Brooks uses Dan's poem The Canonization as a test case to prove his theory that the language of poetry is a language of paradox. What is the paradox that we have in this poem? Dan presents profane love as divine love that is a paradox. He argues and then at the end proves in poetry that his love is equal to holy love spiritual love, so it can be canonized. We have a conflict between the material world and the spiritual world. What the world says, what the people say in on the one hand and what the scriptures or the church says on the other hand, these two always conflict with each other. There is a shift from a note of irritation at the beginning to a note of triumph at the end of the poem. This triumph is presented to us in the form of two birds becoming one that is phoenix. The poet and the lady love 
they live for each other and they die for each other. And this experience is presented in the form of a well wrought urn which is preserved for immortality and this poem is similar to that urn which is immortal. At the end Clark Brooks argues that the language of poetry is a language of paradox and extends it to the paradox of the imagination. We can extend it to the paradox of language, the paradox of poetry and of course to life in general. Here is another interesting deconstructive reading by Jonathan Culler in his book on deconstruction. Culler notices two worlds, two separate worlds, the private world and the public world. According to Culler, Dunn valorizes that is gives more importance to the private world of love as against the public world of norms or authority. Then Culler argues that the poem enacts the power of the public world loudly because Dunn spends so much time for engaging with the authority of the world. So, Culler says the poem is self-referential and the meaning of the poem is undecidable. Is the poem about the urn? Is the urn about the poem? What is it? It is not easy to decide. He says feature readings are inscribed in the poem and the urn. The way in which we read the poem is inscribed that is embedded within the poem. What is the achievement of this poem or this poet? We know very well life is short, but art is long. The urn, the poem, the pattern of love, the tombs, the hearse, the chronicles, the sonnets are all forms of art. Art is long. Lovers may die, but love lives forever in poetry in different artistic forms. As a result, Dunn who wrote a poem on love lives forever in poetry. Dunn created a space for many readers including Clamp Brooks, Jonathan Culler and probably all those who follow Derrida for you and me in time. He offers a pattern of love as well as of reading and I believe a pattern of living as well. To conclude, we saw the historical and literary context which enabled John Dunn to write poems with far-fetched comparisons about the human experience of love for God and also for human beings. We spent some time with a valediction forbidding morning and drew the, our attention to the compass conceit. In canonization, Dunn uses similar conceits canonization is a conceit that he uses throughout the poem. Normally canonization is restricted to a spiritual experience, but then Dunn brings it to the domestic world, private experience of love between two human beings. We paid attention to various poetic devices, rhythm, rhyme, meter and so on to indicate how Dunn is able to achieve his artistic purpose through various linguistic rhetorical devices. We looked into two critical readings offered by two great critics, Clamp Brooks and Jonathan Culler. If the new critical reading says it is a paradoxical poem, so it is the best poem or one of the best poems. Culler says it is a poem, it is an exemplary poem because it deconstructs itself by drawing attention to the way in which Dunn has spent so much time for valorizing the world as against the private world. Some references will help you to understand this poem much more. Here are many, but you can read at least two. Brooks and Culler. If you want to read just one reference, it would be good to read 
Dayton Haskins 1993 essay, A History of Dance Canonization from Isaac Walton to Clant Brooks to know about the opinions of various readers on this canonical poem called The Canonization. Thank you.